Defining the outcome in epidemiology is always one of the first tasks of study design. We're going to talk about the problems that we face when we're using data that aren't really adapted to our research purposes, data that have been collected for something else, and we have to figure out how to make a clinical case definition that's also a good functioning epidemiologic case definition. The kinds of data systems that we're going to talk about today are ones like large uh, insurance databases and electronic medical records, where the elements that might be relevant to a case definition are present, but they don't correspond to the kinds of research definitions that we would use if we could do our data collection in advance. The problem that we're going to face is how to map clinical conditions onto the information that's available in large databases. This isn't a matter of going one-to-one -to, -one to, to make a correspondence exactly, uh, one code to one condition. Instead, it's going to be a matter of looking at how a disease manifests itself and then how that translates into the records that are available to us. I first began to think about this problem some years ago, looking at the determinants of peptic ulcer and bleeding in people who had received NSAIDs. I'm going to show you a insurance claims history from a 47-year-old woman. What we have here are a combination of the diagnoses that are associated with medical visits and other services and the occurrence of procedures and diagnostic tests. We have a woman who in May is identified as having cholecystitis. Eight days later, the diagnosis switches simply to abdominal pain. And in June, she has a diagnosis of other abdominal and pelvic symptoms. Later on in June, the doctor begins to do some diagnostic testing. You see a serum amylase and a blood lipase, testing for possibility of pancreatitis. And there's also a hemoglobin, that's a complete blood count, to assess whether or not there's been blood loss. Finally, a couple of days later in June, she has a contrast x-ray of the upper abdomen, and she has an echo exam of the abdomen. Following on that pair of diagnostic uh, examinations, she gets a, a diagnosis of duodenal ulcer. Later on in July, she gets a nonspecific diagnosis again, this one of other abdominal and pelvic symptoms, and uh, gets upper GI endoscopy and has a diagnosis of duodenal ulcer. Now at the end of the fall, she also has another diagnosis of chest pain. So there's a story here. We have somebody coming in with abdominal pain, which is a, initially diagnosed as cholecystitis, but for reasons that aren't recorded, the doctor gives up that diagnosis. The doctor does tests for a pancreatitis, and there, probably, there may be an indication of blood loss from the uh, complete blood count, and that leads to the examinations of the uh, x-ray examinations that uh, perhaps are suggestive for the presence of an ulcer. The pain goes on, perhaps doesn't uh, respond to some simple anti-ulcer medications, and the physician has some doubt that there is uh, uh, abdominal pain might be due to something else, and finally does or orders an endoscopy, at which point we definitively say that this is a peptic ulcer. So that's the clinical story uh, that we might imagine following on these insurance claims data. That diagnosis of chest pain at the end of the fall, it could be anything. Uh, there, no, it could be many things. I'd like to look at the ways in which these claims follow on one another and begin to categorize them. First, we see that the diagnoses uh, are different from one another in regard to their specificity. A diagnosis like other abdominal or pelvic pain or pelvic symptoms is a relatively nonspecific diagnosis. The duodenal ulcer is a relatively specific diagnosis. And in this case, we see that they're uh, separated by a quite a specific test, which is the uh, the endoscopy. The tests themselves can be specific or non-specific. The hemogram is really telling us about whether or not there's been blood loss. But by comparison, the endoscopy is really very specific for telling us that there's an ulcer. Sometimes the timing is part of the clinical story that we want to tell. We saw in this lady's history the sequence going from a non-specific diagnosis through a specific test to a more specific diagnosis. But what if it had been completely different? What if the same elements had come in the opposite sequence, starting off with the specific diagnosis and having the definitive test coming out to the nonspecific diagnosis? Well, we might be inclined to believe that this sequence is incompatible with there truly having been a peptic ulcer. And in fact, the, in this sequence, what we have is the endoscopy ruling out the, uh, the initial diagnosis of peptic ulcer. 
Claims histories also have alternative diagnoses that may come into play in understanding what's gone on. For example, the, the cholecystitis is a diagnosis that was entertained in the beginning and that was eventually ruled out. By contrast, the chest pain is a new diagnosis which may be compatible with, with what's gone bef before manifesting the peptic ulcer, but could, it could also be the uh, indication of a completely separate disease. Let's take the experience of looking at this lady's claim and see how a researcher might go about setting up some expert rules for reading claims. We've mentioned several already. If you start with a nonspecific diagnosis and go to a specific diagnosis by way of a very specific test, we might well say let's accept the specific diagnosis as having arisen from the test. By contrast, if we start with a specific diagnosis and go through a specific test to a non-specific diagnosis, we would be very inclined to reject that diagnosis as a condition the patient has. And if the test is non-specific, we don't really know what's going on and we can't really you know, use that to adjudicate between specific and non-specific diagnoses. Interestingly, all of these rules apply not just to peptic ulcer disease that we've been looking at here, but they might well apply to all of the other diagnoses which have been noted in this uh, lady's claim history. The uh, cholecystitis, the abdominal pain, and the chest pain all play into a set of rules like this. Let's imagine the sequence of information generation that we would need if we started from an insurance claims database. First, we would need to identify candidate individuals for study. We'd start with a sensitive but possibly a nonspecific diagnosis. We might take all the people with any diagnosis of ulcer plus any abdominal pain. We draw a sample of, of individuals from that universe of people with the candidate diagnosis, and we create a chronological sequence of insurance claims and ask a clinical expert to classify those according to whether he or she thinks that this is the target disease that we're, uh, we're looking for. The expert records that classification and we, we write down the elements that the expert tells us are important to the classification for each particular case. So we take the expert's observations and reasons and turn them into an algorithm that seems to capture the cases. Having created the algorithm, we can then draw another sample of cases and classify them according to the algorithm and asks the expert again to review the cases against his or her clinical knowledge and compare that to the results of the algorithm. If the algorithm is in accord with the expert, then we say we've captured the expert's assessment of these kinds of data. If there are disagreements, we ask the expert what the basis of the disagreement is and we modify the algorithm. That cycles through again and again until we get to, to a stable situation where the algorithm seems to mimic the expert. Here's an example and some work that we did looking at the problem of classifying different kinds of epilepsy using insurance claims data. We started off with people in groups represented by the major epilepsy codes and drew uh, samples of each and presented those to the expert for classification as, as to what they were. We then drew another group of, of individuals, fresh cases, and classified those according to what seemed to be the rule that the expert had been using and looked for the correspondence between them. Eventually, cycling through this process, we came to a rule that mimicked what the expert did. Here's the rule. You can see the elements of how this thing grew. We started off with the expert uh, saying that a diagnosis was confirmed if there were uh, two outpatient visits with that diagnosis went on to add the possibility of a single diagnosis with a hospitalization, and then went on to uh, further additions, changes, exceptions, different ways of coming into a particular diagnosis. This thing isn't elegant, but it's not supposed to be elegant. To capture what happens in the claims data, simply to reproduce the expert's uh, view. There are two ways of seeing this, depending on how many of the potential cases the expert has had to review. If all of the potential cases has come to the expert review, then we can look at the algorithm as simply a statement now for other people to examine what the expert did. So we've removed the expert adjudication from the black box realm into a mechanical set of rules that other experts can examine. If there's a large number of potential cases in the data, then what we've done has been to simply capture the way the expert is processing the information. We still have a set of rules that, that can be 
examined, but now we don't anymore have a complete coverage of the cases. What's important in looking at these rules, and the reason that they're inelegant, is that we're not looking at a high level of definition of the essence of what it means to have a particular disease. We're simply adapting to the technology of claims data and working out, say, a mapping from those complex claims data into the world that we're more comfortable with of clinical diagnosis. There's really nothing generalizable about these rules. The rules pertain to a particular set of data obtained in a particular way at a particular time. Sometimes we have access to medical charts, which allow us to take the claims validation and claims uh, analysis to a, a more sophisticated level. This will arise when the number of cases in a study is still too large to do a complete chart validation, but we do have the resources to do a sample of charts. Here's how we modified the algorithm for creating a case definition rule. We, again, start off with a sensitive but uh, nonspecific rule and draw a series of candidate cases from that. We go to the charts directly and abstract them to get the relevant information and ask our uh, expert to adjudicate all of those charts. Then, one by one, the expert compares the chart adjudication to the claims histories and writes down what it is in the claims history that could have been used to predict the chart result. And that rule, with each new case examined, gets updated until after examining all of the cases, we have a predictive rule. We program that rule into our data and have the expert go back to square one, and we compare each case with its classification against the expert's adjudication, and we ask the expert to consider whether the classification scheme needs to be changed. Again, we iterate through this set of cases again and again until the rule is one which reproduces the expert's adjudication of the validated chart status in a stable way. What we have is an algorithm that isn't telling us truth. It's telling us what the expert would have said, given the same claims data. Here's an example uh, from looking at the problem of ischemic colitis. Thing. We started with a, uh, a code, which is quite a general code, for a vascular insufficiency of the intestine. We uh, identified a number of situations in which that code was unlikely to be representing uh, colonic ischemia, and then drew a sample of charts, which were sent out for review. Now, that chart extraction needs to be done in a way that generates data that can be used for case definition. And in advance of sending abstractors out, we put together a series of categories in which we wanted to have data collected, which would serve for chart validation. The cycle of comparing the claims data that were characteristic of each patient to the chart validation led to a structure of an algorithm that included first inclusion criteria and then exclusion criteria, which represented alternate explanations for the code that drew the person into the study that were present in the data, and after which the diagnosis of colonic ischemia became unlikely. Because chart validation was available, we could look at the relationship between the algorithm and what the charts actually said. In this table, you'll see that the algorithm ended up having a sensitivity of over 80%. So let's summarize this approach to creating case definitions using insurance data, which may be supplemented by chart validation. First, we realize that we're moving between a clinical definition and a set of pieces of information which were not designed for clinical research. So that the mapping is not a matter of finding the right code to describe the right the disease. It's really going to be a matter of looking for patterns of codes that are compatible with the disease. We need to consider uh, the data elements, and we realize that some diagnoses are specific and some are nonspecific, that uh, some terms may ultimately be describing the same thing. Timing is going to be an important part of the interpretation of codes. All of this has to be interpreted in light of the clinical knowledge of how these cases that we're looking for might present, which means that you absolutely have to have a clinical expert as part of the team. The clinical expert will also help us with what's called the differential diagnosis. That is, the other diagnoses that may have been going through the minds of the uh, treating physicians when the patient was being seen. The algorithm that these are put together with is developed iteratively. It requires the expertise of the clinician as well as somebody who knows the data and the structure of the data. And what we're shooting for in this case is local validity.
Here are the uh, sources that you might want to look at for the, for the examples I've given. Thanks very much for your attention.